Afternoon keynotes. Please welcome to the stage Back Market co founder and CEO Thibaut Hug de la Rose. Thibaut will be interviewed by Frederick Court, founder and managing partner at Felix Capital. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Frederick Court. Uh, welcome, Thibault. Good to see you here. Thank you. So I hope you guys can deal with English with a strong French accent, because both of us are, are very good on that front. Um, so Thibault, um, uh, you're the no, co-founder of Back Market. Um, can you describe the company in what sentence? What is Back Market about? Yeah, well, thanks for having me first uh, on that fancy stage. Uh, so Back Market basically uh, aims to be the global leader of circular economy for tech products. Uh, it's 100% marketplace. Um, it's operating in 16 countries across three regions. And our mission is literally to extend the life of tech products as long as possible through circularity and repair. And so what was the, the spark or how did it start? When did, when did you start and uh, can you tell us about that, that initial moment? So it started uh, basically a bit more than eight years ago. Um, I come from a family full of entrepreneurs. So basically, uh, we always talk about business creation uh, every Sunday uh, for lunch, basically. So I grew up with uh, that idea of uh, if you want freedom and uh, uh, and if you want to enjoy your life, you have to create a company, kind of. Um, and so I knew I wanted to create one, but I did not know what. I just wanted to create something that makes sense and have a positive impact. Uh, so it could have been in the med space, in the social space. But uh, then I started to work um, in a company called Netiven uh, in the e-commerce space. And uh, I was a key account manager, I had 20 accounts to deal with. And my job was to help them grow their business online, basically. And four of them were refurbishing factories. And so the sparkle came when I visited physically one of those. Um, I, I discovered the operations. Uh, I discovered that they were literally reviving products and operating, dismantling products, changing components in order to give them a second life, a third life. Uh, and so I saw the back office, the magic of the back office, and I thought, okay, nobody knows about what you're doing, guys. I'm just selling your product on Amazon, on eBay, on Price Minister, whatever. And so I thought, okay, uh, there, there is a need for a space and one single stop shop for those products uh, because I'm, I'm sure consumer will, uh, will love it. So you know, before we, we, we talk about the, who the customer is at, at Back Market, so you mentioned some you know, pretty big businesses who are already operating in this space. So how did you start? How did you get funding? Did you uh, fund it yourself at the beginning? What, what was the, the journey to, to get to market? So, so we are three co-founders. We started at two, the CTO and myself. I'm more the business guy. So I had a relationship with uh, the four first refurbishers. Uh, he was designing the, like actually creating the platform and all the, 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 the feeds and the flows. Uh, and then we met with Vinny, our third co-founder. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, we paid him. He was a, a brand strategist. Uh, and so we had 15K only in the bank, which was uh, our saving from our previous job, basically. And so we couldn't afford to pay any marketing. Uh, so he was our marketing investment uh, at the beginning. And we started with uh, those 15K and him. Uh, basically, um, to, to launch the company. And we opened in November 2014. We started to have sales. And after one month, the first customer we didn't know about, uh, didn't know about our family and friends. Uh, and then uh, the, the metrics were already pretty good in, in France. And so we, we raised the first seed round in May 2015. Yeah. And at that point, and, and compared to now, maybe to give a concrete example, what are the you know, top selling products? Uh, you know, what do people get on back market typically? So top selling product is smartphone. Uh, it's 65% of our business. Uh, at the beginning, we started with only smartphones. Now there is 184 categories of product being sold. So you can find any electronic product on back market. So white goods, speakers, TVs, whatever you name them. And uh, so with the customer today um, and you know, who goes uh, on back market and um, I was curious to, to understand if it was driven by you know, price, uh, by co convenience or, or more driven by uh, you know, sustainability and uh, uh, the, the ambitions to be a more conscious consumer. 
Yeah. So there is two cohorts, uh, leading cohorts of customers uh, at back market. The first one is uh, 18 to 30 years old uh, people, uh, mostly driven by um, the price. 60% uh, uh, are answering I came and bought because of the price discount. The second um, is uh, trust, all the level of warranties and services we are adding on top of the transaction, which is actually the main difference between back market and, and its competitor. So there is a back market experience that distinctive from, from other platforms. Yeah, it's distinctive. We make dynamic creation uh, based on quality and trust. We only showcase one listing per product page, uh, if it's not technical, but basically we make the job for the customer to to push the only offer for one single product uh, that uh, has the most probability of, uh, of giving him a good experience. Uh, so that's the main difference. And the third uh, reason to come is ecology. Uh, basically, at the beginning, uh, it was uh, only 3% of the people responded, uh, I came to buy on back market because uh, I want to make an ecological purchase. Uh, now it's 25% plus. And um, so that, that's growing, but also on your side, I think uh, when we were discussing about uh, back market, um, uh, you, you have the ambition to build a business with purpose. Um, and I know, you know the company is also very analytical. So how does it manifest itself within the business in terms of the type of people you, you seek to hire, type of metrics you might be tracking and how you are reporting against that goal? Um, so, um, to give you a concrete example, every week we start with a Monday brief uh, at 9 a.m. Uh, we have uh, all the company connected uh, uh, either on Zoom or either at the office. And uh, the first slide is about uh, the performance of every market, so the GMV uh, of every market, the growth year on year, uh, plus the CO2 emissions avoided and the raw materials uh, avoided uh, thanks to the sales. So, those three KPIs are the first thing that every backmaker sees when they kick off the week uh, to measure our performance. Um, and that's against a certain goal that you set yourself as part of your, your goal for, for the year? So the main goal and the main KPI for us is to basically uh, shift the, the customer from buying new to buying circular economy and, buying so, and so buying refurbished. And so far now for tech products, uh, refurbished is only uh, 7% uh, of the consumption. It's where the car industry was 30 years ago, basically. 92% were new cars being sold. And so uh, we want to bring the right level of convenience and trust on top of those transactions in order to accelerate the switch from 7 to 50 plus 70 uh, uh, in the end. So our golden KPI is, is really the market segment share of refurbished versus new. And we want to keep growing that uh, to, to, to the biggest as possible. And you, are they the, the, the same metric that you are tracking in every market? Because uh, you, know, you started in France, but quite quickly, uh, even though the company is only seven and a half uh, years old, you started to expand internationally. So I was curious if there is a, you know, a playbook of how to move internationally and what are the, the key learnings from that? So a lot of learnings. We started in 2016 to open our first uh, other country than France. Um, what I can say is that uh, I think today we have 85% of the playbook. Uh, when we open a new country, we know uh, there's this uh, to be done uh, on the technical, on the upside, on the marketing side, on the operation. Uh, but then you need to adapt. Uh, so an example is uh, the supply. So back markets operating in the US, in Europe, and in Asia. We have three supply networks, really. Uh, one for each region. Uh, so as the density of circular economy uh, when it comes to depth of inventory is, is not that, uh, that deep, you need cross-border in order to be able to offer a uh, right level of, uh, of inventory and, uh, and experience uh, at the same time to your customer. Uh, so cross-border, especially for Europe, is important to have. But we noticed when we opened the UK market two years ago and uh, uh, Brexit happened, um, we shifted from having cross-border supply from the UK to Europe and from the Europe to UK down to zero cross-border. And so we had suddenly local UK supply only focused on UK demand, and that was very virtuous. So it was counterintuitive for us, but we divided the number of listings back on backmarket.co.uk by three uh, in the morning, but we saw the conversion rate going 3x uh, higher 
uh, because prices were going on, uh, down, they were 100% focused on this market. And we also saw the star, so the satisfaction uh, after a client, a client has, a, has a claim, uh, going up uh, again. So basically, cross-border is important to get started, um, but uh, local uh, brings a lot of value. Uh, so local supply, but also local merchandising, maybe different products working different. And also local merchandising is, is important. It's part of the 15% uh, adaptations that you need to have. Um, because the level, for example, of uh, uh, awareness uh, around ecology is not the same everywhere. Uh, so, so yes, you need also to adapt that. And uh, so I had the opportunity to use uh, back market recently. My, my mom lost her phone and she wanted a specific, the same model. And the other way to get it was to get it uh, uh, secondhand through resale. And I was very impressed by the consistency of the brand at every touch point. Um, so is that something that you've been working on in particular? Why sometimes on you know, market pla places can be quite fragmented or more unexpected in terms of experience? I think it's it's part of uh, you know having Vianney, my uh, third co-founder on board since uh, the beginning. Uh, when you don't have money to spend uh, on Google on marketing, you focus 100% on your experience, and you want to make sure every single customer gets a smooth experience and and kind of uh, remember the brand and uh, create a positive attachment to, to to your platform. And so since day one, it's been super uh, important for us. So. It needs to be convenient and it needs to be uh, uh, as smooth as possible in every path of the funnel. Uh, but on top of that, uh, I think the brand consistency is also very, very important because e-commerce is, uh, is quite a wide uh, space and you need to make sure uh, um, you're providing a unique experience to, to your users. So I'm glad uh, <laughs> you had those. It worked, it worked really well. And, but the, but so age-wise, how, uh, no, the, the, how old is the customer? Is that more of a younger people type behavior to come and, and uh, shop on, on back market? So, so yeah, the, the first cohort is uh, 18 to 30. It's really the, the, the largest cohort. But after that, uh, there is a little gap and it's, it's basically 35 to 50 parents, basically. Uh, so, Students, it's quite normal. It's because of uh, uh, savings. They come because uh, they don't want to spend thousand dollars on the last uh, uh, smartphone, uh, and so they are happy to take a discount and uh, not taking uh, too many risks by buying peer to peer. Uh, parents, it's it's also a saving, but it's also for uh, um, and we found that afterward, but. Uh, uh, with uh, some studies, it's also because they want to uh, have a positive education with their children. They don't want to offer the, la the last product in town, etc. So uh, there is also like refurbish is a great uh, way to, to, to say, no, you're not getting the last, you're getting this one. Uh, and that behavior is consistent country across multiple countries as well. So it's quite a kind of a global opportunity for you. Yes, it's uh, uh, happily working across the globe and uh, the model is traveling well. Uh, so um, we have steady cohorts uh, and you can see and track the LTV uh, and, and kind of know where you land uh, after 12 months and 18 months after the first uh, six months. You already have uh, good repeat patterns, etc. To, to see the trajectory and trajectories are, are, are very, very similar. Yeah. And so can you share with us maybe the next market you might be uh, opening in? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, the next market is going to be South Korea for us. Uh, so it's, it's quite logical after a year in Japan. Uh, we're very happy with uh, the results. Uh, there's basically a huge uh, penetration of uh, both e-commerce and tech, uh, but nobody's standing behind the large retailer of new, which are Amazon and, uh, Amazon and Rakuten, basically, and uh, kind of a Craigslist or Le Bon Coin, or, um, which is called Mercari in Japan. Uh, so there is a room in the middle, which is exactly what we take uh, with back market. Same is happening in South Korea, even if the, they have different names. Um, so now that we've uh, we've met the proof of concept, let's say in uh, in Asia, we really want to to move next. Uh, and in these cases, you are recruiting locally, local teams to, to run those. Yes, we have to because I th this is a le also a learning of international development. At the beginning, we were doing everything from Central, so from Paris. Uh, that was great for zero to one in every country, and we already had tractions. But then the 10 to 15% adaptation that you need to make uh, is actually what's going to make the country work or not. So it's, it's, it's critical to, to make that happen. And, and on the way to that, it's native people that are making the difference. 
uh, you need people on the ground, both to make connections with the local suppliers, uh, build trust around the, the platform and make sure they're engaged, and seize also the right opportunity when it comes to the demand. So on the PR strategy, on the marketing strategy, on the brand building construction, there is one brand, it's the same, it's back market, but basically you are the same person, but you have to present yourself slightly bit differently according to cultural differences. And, and that's, that only can come through uh, native people and on the ground. Yeah. So that must come with challenges in terms of uh, having different markets, but one company, one culture, I don't know how many employees you have today and how do you create the, the glue and the connection through the same uh, values to make sure that you, you hire people in line with the uh, you know, purpose you described earlier? So that's, uh, I'm not going to lie, that's a challenge. Uh, and that's a, that's a big one. We are 700, uh, 680 to be accurate today. Um, and uh, across uh, 16 countries, basically. So it's work, basically. Uh, we, we have those refreshing uh, workshop uh, every uh, two to three years at the whole hands, uh, which is uh, once every year we meet up, all of us, uh, at the same uh, place. And uh, we ask ourselves the questions uh, around the values, existing values of black market. And the three questions are, what's important for you that you really want to keep? Second question is, where do you don't see anymore uh, yourself, etc.? And the third one is, what's missing for you? And so it's little groups of 10 to 15 people. And then there is a, a bottom up, up to, um, to, to my co-founders. Uh, and, and, and we refresh uh, the value and, uh, and, and then once you refresh those, you have to implement them into the life of the company. So hiring processes, uh, meetings processes, uh, down to the outboarding, basically. Uh, so that's, that's work, but uh, I think it's, if you don't do that, then you lose what you call the glue and uh, it's, it's impossible to, to grow and to manage. And do you get, uh, wh where do you get your input in terms of what products to put on the platform? Because you started with smartphones, a large part of the business, uh, but uh, you know, resale could be applied the way, you know, the way you do it to many other verticals, uh, some B2B verticals, some consumer verticals. Uh, how are you thinking about uh, how to extend the platform and is this input coming from the local markets or from the consumers? So basically we already uh, see a lot of demands in many different categories that we don't match. Uh, so we build on like within the 184 uh, uh, categories that we sell, they are definitely not equally stuffed in terms of supply. So we take where the demand is the highest, uh, the level of demand is the highest, then we map the existing suppliers and ecosystem of, of repair and refurbishers existing uh, in the supply hubs uh, where we are. Um, and uh, we start with those. And most of the time, there is a need to uh, create extra, uh, um, extra professionals and it creates also new businesses because we provide them, we give them all the data of the demand so it helps them to forecast, okay, oh, I can uh, buy that much, etc. And we, we give them a, a playbook on strong guidance on all our data on the demand in order to, to scale their operation or to build uh, another one. This is how we, we extend from, uh, you know, we extend it basically from smartphones to tablets and then to computer and not to gaming console headsets uh, and, and, and beyond. And, um, and are you also extending the model to uh, the products I might already have in my home? Because uh, uh, all the sellers are professionals, but uh, as a consumer maybe looking to buy a new product, can I send you back my previous phone as I get a new one? So you, you can do that only in the US, in France and in Germany for now, but by the end of the year, you will be able to do that in the UK as well and in other geographies. Um, it's what we call the buyback. So it's, it's another marketplace within back market, but basically the idea is you have the, the app and you say I have that product, it works or it doesn't. And we give you the best offer from a refurbisher mm. on that product. Uh, and we, through that program, we had 450,000 single units being traded in, only in France and Germany last year. So there is huge demand uh, for that already, we know. Uh, and we know it's bringing a lot of value for both customers and sellers because it's raw materials basically that they're getting through that program. Uh, so it's, 
it's uh, an expansion phase that we are uh, right in the middle uh, of right now. So that's a new no expansion, but we are also getting into a more difficult time for the economy um, uh, and also more you know, pressure on the environment, uh, which is you know, uh, something you're thinking about quite a lot. So in this context, what are you worried about? And maybe a la last uh, comments on what action you're taking uh, to look at uh, this new environment. So I think we need to keep on being 100% focused on our mission. I think no matter the, the environment, the mission remain and the fundamentals are strong. So uh, you need to have your company 100% focused on that. You have to make sure you put all your efforts in order to maximize the value creation to your users. And users need to go first. Uh, and not yourself, the, the, the challenges, one of the most, the biggest challenges and what can keep me up at night sometimes is, okay, uh, we are getting bigger in terms of number of employees. Let's make sure we always think that way. Uh, because with the scale, you need to also spend some effort on uh, alignment, uh, making communication easy and smooth and operations running. Um, but don't forget uh, user and customer first. Uh, and that's, that needs to, to stay on top all the time. So that will be the conclusion. Let's not forget the, the customer and make it first. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thibault. Thank you, uh, Frédéric. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for listening.